Welcome back to Smart Pack's Ask the Vet video series with Staff Veterinarian and Medical Director, Dr. Lydia Gray. Hello there. If you've never seen an Ask the Vet before, we want to give you a quick rundown of how it works. So first, you ask the questions on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, our blog, any of the above, or emailing customer care at smartpack.com using hashtag ask the vet video okay. so that we can keep track of all of the fantastic questions that are getting asked out there. Right. Then we take all of the questions, put them up in a poll on our blog, and you get to vote on which ones you want us to answer in the next month's video. Mm -hmm. And so the questions are submitted by you guys, and then they're voted on by you guys, and then you can vote as many times as you like, which is nice. Yep. Uh, it's not always the case. <laughs> <laughs> and the top five questions get answered, but the best part is that if your question is voted into the top five and we answer it in a video, not only do you get to hear a brilliant response to your video, Thank you. uh, you're welcome. You also get a Smart Pack gift card, which is a really awesome thing because we have a lot of great stuff for you, your horse, anything you want, supplements. I think everyone probably <laughs> spends the gift cards on supplements. Right. I know I would. So um, all of the questions are automatically eligible to be selected, but you can check out our playlist to see if there's a question that's similar to yours that's already been answered. Because we've been doing these for a couple months yeah, now, we've gotten a lot of really great questions. And we do see some that come in as questions that we've answered before. And so we want you guys to know if there's an answer out there. So take a look first and see if you can ask a different question. We do have, shockingly, some people out there in the world who have not claimed their Smart Pack gift card. What? So their question was selected, we answered it, people enjoyed getting to see the answer, and that person still hasn't been rewarded. So if you have submitted a question and you haven't gotten your gift card, email customercare at smartpack.com and we will take care of that for you right away. Are, Are you ready? ready? Yes. Okay, now that we know how it works. Let's jump into question one. Okay. This one was submitted by Indianola594 on YouTube. And can I tell you that I love some of these call, called signs, handles? Yeah, the, the people's names, yeah. people's uh, nomers. So uh, Nels noted, uh, Nels is our videographer. You guys don't get to see him, but he's waiting <laughs> from behind the camera. And he noted on this one that uh, this got the most votes ever on a single question. And we did notice that they all came in pretty quickly <laughs> at the same time. So I think this might have been using some of that uh, opportunity to vote more vote than once. early and often. Yeah. I like that. Early mm -hmm. and often. Okay. Since October means Halloween, which I love, <laughs> I was wondering about warts in horses. Oh, this is good. A horse I am looking after for a friend has a white wart in his ear. How can warts be treated, prevented, and kept from being passed on from horse to horse? All right. So warts, there's a couple kinds of warts. There's the ear warts. I might call them ear papillomas. Okay. Um, others might call them aural plaques, A-U-R-A-L, mm. aural. Um, and then there's the kinds of warts that are more Halloween-y that are on like the end of your nose and <laughs> muzzle on horses, okay? Those kind of warts, um, and they're all the equine papilloma virus. So they're all caused by the same virus, which is contagious. So preventing spread is a good question. Um, those are seen more often in young horses. So certainly less than four. Um, I'm thinking of a, a, like a yearling is really rare. Mm -hmm. and, and if you've seen them, there's the whole end of their muzzle is just covered with these um, small, they stick out, they're round, they look like like mm, cauliflower, I mean, I'm, you know, mm -hmm. and they're just really mm -hmm. ugly. So the best thing to do is, because they go away, they spontaneously resolve on their own. You don't have to okay. do anything. Okay. But just take the yearling and put them in the back, maybe of the barn for a couple months, and then it's fine. Um, but you do have to be careful that they don't fall off and that you don't use brushes and halters and spread them. So be a little bit careful to try to contain um, the, the warts on those. But she's asking about ear warts, mm -hmm. and those are a little, little different, the oral plaques. Um, those are more in adult horses. They are flat. They don't stick out or protrude. Um, they're not stalk-like, like the ones in the muzzle. And they're, you see them as flat white in the ear. They're of, caused by the equine papilloma virus, but they're spread by flies. So Ooh. prevention Unexpected. is, I have a prop back here. Oh, here we go. Let's I, take know, this I, one I out. know what's happening. The prevention is to get a fly mask that has ears and that way flies don't get in your horse's ears and spread the papillomavirus. 
Um, for the same reason, once you're trying to treat them, if you because horses can get a little head shy, ear shy. They mm -hmm. they they hurt. They bother them. They know they're there. Um, you can put the flies the the fly mask on with the ears after it and keep the flies out and keep them from being pestered about the ears. There there hasn't been for years a treatment for thorough plaques. You just sort of ignore them, don't look, don't pester them, don't bother them, don't put stuff on there because the more you, you address them, the more irritated they get, the horse gets, it's bad. But now, for the last maybe two years, there is a new cream, prescription cream, that you can get from your vet that um, it's quite painful and sometimes the horses have to be sedated mm. for it, it to be uh, put on but it does work really great. Oh. So if you have a horse that just leaving it alone is not enough, he really is really bothered by this, then you might want to talk to your vet about that cream. Mm -hmm. um, but even the, the, the ear, uh, the oral plaques and the, the ones on the nose, they are caused by a virus, so they are infectious contagious. and contagious. Yeah. And so there is an, an element of, I need to not spread this around. So if you're Petting noses, you know, you don't just don't go down the barn and pet all the noses and stick your fingers in all the ears and spread it because you can. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. So, so definitely do pet the noses. Just wash your hands, you know, oh, right, and be right. careful when you're going from nose to nose because exactly. you don't want to not pet the noses. Oh my gosh, yeah. it's it's kind of the best part. <laughs> When you were describing that, you said oral plaques, which sounds a lot like oral, and so right. if O R A L is related to the mouth, A U R A L is related yeah. to the ears. Exactly. All right. You learn something new every day. <laughs> okay, so our next question was submitted by Amber on YouTube, and we have, my horse bites the fence and sucks in. One, what is it called? Two, he is not gaining weight. Is that because he does that? And three, what can I do? Okay, number one, what's it called? Cribbing. I got this one. <laughs> um, Nailed it. Yeah, so cribbing is, um, it's what's called a, a stereotypy, and the definition is, seemingly functionless repetitive behavior. So what falls in here, uh, cribbing, st uh, weaving, stall walking, pawing, and not head shaking, let's be clear, but like a head bobbing. Some mm. horses just get in this habit of head, head bobbing. Like yeah, exactly, you did it very well. Yeah, I've, um, I'm familiar. Okay, <laughs> so we, we're learning more and more about these. We, we think we know something and then it's completely wrong. And then we think we know something else, so, um, her second question was... He's not getting weight. Right. So why do we care about cribbing and the other, the other stereotypes? Because not gaining weight can be part of the problem. If it's just um, cosmetic, then it's, it's one of those things, I feel like I say this a lot, but just ignore it. Don't look. Don't, you know, it's, they do it. They have a reason they do it. And, and there's something in the environment missing or something in his life, maybe a stress. And he is resolving this by this cribbing action. And maybe we should go over what that looks like for people who don't know, but they, they hook their front teeth over a horizontal um, object, like a, like a fence board. Mm -hmm. And then they, they arch their neck a little bit and they, they pull back and they suck in. And it sometimes sounds like a grunt mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're pulling in there. And they just they just keep doing that. Did you want me to do that one too? Not really. <laughs> I thought yeah. that might be. Yeah. Thought that might be your answer. Yeah. I'm okay. hoping maybe our videographer will have a video. Oh, that yeah. is yeah. probably more yeah. likely so, than. So that's what it looks like. That's what it's it. called. And what can um, she do? Let me like, answer some more of those. So her horse is losing weight. Mm -hmm. There are some. There can be performance issues because they hook their front teeth over. You can have some some dental issues. Mm. There is one specific type of colic associated with this. It's called epiploic foramen entrapment. I know. It's a good one. Yeah. We won't spell that no. one. No. Um, well, we will on the screen. No, that's but fair. Not us. Yeah, no. Yeah. So there are some, if, if your horse is experiencing health problems, conditions because of cribbing, then certainly something needs to be done. But if not, it might be better off just letting him uh, cope with whatever stress in his life. This is his method of coping. Okay. So, All okay. right. What was the next one? Uh, what can she do? Oh. And so I think you the, close your eyes. Well, Don't that look. and then you, you know figure out, try to figure out, go through your horse's life with your vet. What could possibly be the problem? So, is he inside too much? If so, turn him out. Does he need to socialize more with other horses? Um, are you feeding enough hay? Mm -hmm. Because long stem forage. If they've got something to chew on they might not feel the need to go do that with their, with their mouth. 
So there, uh, there are quite a few lists or steps, check, checklist, that you can run through and say, is, is this right in my horse's life? Is this right in my horse's life? And maybe you'll find something. Um, there doesn't seem to be, because I know this was a question that you wanted to ask, and I'm, I'm like a mind reader. Um, do horses see another horse do this mm. and then pick it up? No. So this is not contagious? No. This cribbing is not contagious and you heard it here first. Okay. Yes, perfect. And none of the other ones are either. Weaving, stall walking, head bobbing, not contagious? No. Wow. There's not mimicry involved. Busting wives' tails. Old wives' tails. Or husband's Left tails. I mean, we right. don't know. We don't know. We it don't. could be husband's it's, tails. That's true. That's true. Um, so on the question of what's it called, I've heard some people say that their horse is a wind sucker. Is that the same thing as cribbing? Is that a totally different thing? It could be some parts of the country or the world say wind sucking mm. um, without being... So it's like soda versus pop. A little bit. Or Which one are bag you? Bag versus, I think soda. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or bag versus, I don't even know the other word. Sack. Oh, bag yeah. Bag and sack, yeah. Um, they're, they're without being uh, too, too um, vulgar. Wind sucking can sometimes refer to a, a, a situation that occurs in the back end of the horse. Oh, so it's probably only female horses. It is only mm -hmm. female horses. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'm with what you. I thought you were going to ask me was wood chewing. Oh, okay. Wood chewing is different. It is not considered a stereotypy, and for the most part, wood chewing is um, a naughty behavior, and it. it probably is linked to a deficiency in the diet. Mm -hmm. So make sure the horse is getting all the vitamins, min minerals, and probably protein that he needs and, and the long stem forage. And that will probably resolve easily. Cribbing is a little bit more complicated and okay. deep seated. Yeah. Okay. A great answer for a great question. Thank you, Amber. <laughs> Debbie on our blog, blog.smartpack.com, for those of you not familiar, asks, what are the best, uh, what months are the best to warm your horses, ponies, and donkeys? Oh, and donkeys. Um, so you know I could talk about parasite control all day long, so I'll try to limit this. Okay, good, because I have a meeting after I know, this. right. Um, so it was, a, I think, a cagey question, because she's trying to get me to help her design her parasite control program, her, her, her um, deworming schedule, sure. and I'm not going to do it because you have to work with your vet to get the, um, the fecal done. And we don't do fecals so that we know if a horse has parasites because they always have parasites. We do fecals to identify the horses, mules, and donkeys. Mm, ponies. And ponies, and minis, and whatever, that if they're a high shedder of parasite eggs or a low shedder. If you're a low shedder, then you just need dewormed twice a year. And you should do it, here's your answer, at the beginning of the grazing season in your area mm. and again at the end of the grazing season. So in the northern climates of the U.S., the beginning is, I don't know, April? April, okay. feels right. And then the end is like October. Yeah, October. Yeah. So kind of like in the spring after the last frost and the fall would be before the first frost. And then it's a little, it's, it's the opposite in the southern climates mm. because it gets so hot in the summer in Florida and Texas and Southern California that um, July, August, there's no grass and there's no parasites uh, transmitting. So there you would still do the same um, spring and fall, but it would be the beginning of grazing season in the fall and the end mm. in the spring. Okay. So now if you have a high shedder, you will have to deworm in between those. But she didn't ask that, so we won't go into that. So it sounds like when you're talking about the shedders and using that to um, determine how often you worm, it's right. really to for property management, not for managing the individual horse's parasite load. We call it individualized deworming because we base it on that fecal. But what we're trying to do now is instead of letting the parasites get into the horse and migrating around and causing all sorts of damage, we are smarter than the parasites. So what we're doing is exactly what you said, trying to prevent contamination on site. And we said, hey, what if we never let the worms get into the horse in the first place? Mm. So we are now deworming strategically and trying to prevent the high shedders from contaminating the environment. And so part of that is also removing manure 
from the environment. Mm. You can't just leave it there and you can't spread it. Yeah, that makes sense. Because it that makes parasites very happy. You hear those tiny cheers when you yeah. spray. Yeah, exactly. When you harrow, because they can only go 20 inches from a pile mm. with, with their little worm feet or whatever they have. Mechanisms. Mechanisms is good. But if you spread them, then you've allowed them access to the whole pasture. Mm. Okay. So more, I, more than she bargained she for. Didn't, <laughs> she didn't ask that, but I knew you did. would, would <gasps> love the opportunity to talk Thank a little you. bit more about it. I appreciate that. Absolutely. So our fourth question was submitted by Nays for Days, terrific name, on oh Instagram. And she is asking, what first aid should all horse owners know? Now, this is not to be confused with the question from last month. What do you think everyone should know before owning a horse, medically speaking? Yeah. But this is first aid. And if you're a horse owner, what should you know? Well, I'm going to answer it like last month. That's okay. Because as I was preparing for this one, because I saw it, it came up in the voting and it went down. It came up and it went down. I'm like, people, make up your mind. <laughs> Um, when I think your about votes it, count. They do. Is what she's telling you. They do. Uh, when I think about this one, it's because there's all levels of horse owners. There's the person who just are, is getting their first horse, and maybe they have no horse background. Mm -hmm. And then there's the person who's owned a lot of horses their whole life, and they're like a vet tag, and they've just done everything. So there's this huge range of skills and knowledge. Based on that, there is no like one answer. Every horse owner must know A, B, and C. So I think the better way to think about this is the first thing you should have is the, the phone number of the closest veterinarian, mm, right? Yep. So that the first thing you should know is you don't know everything. Yeah, I mean, and when anything happens, you call the vet, and the vet will help you work through, is this an emergency that I have to drop everything and come out right now? Is this an emergency, but it can wait till I can squeeze into my schedule maybe later today? Or, based on what I know about you, is this still serious, but you can handle the stage, first stage on your own, and maybe call me back tomorrow and we'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. So your vet, once they know you, can help you work through this can help you triage it. Mm -hmm. So that's really, really important. But in order to even help your vet decide what is an emergency and what's not, you have to know normal. You cannot know abnormal until you know normal. So that's knowing how to take TPR, which we have videos and articles about if you need help with that. And that acronym stands for? Temperature, pulse, and respiration. Okay. Um, I have a new acronym for you. Yes. It's called EDUD. D -D. Eating. Eating, drinking, urinating, defecating? You guys. Yes. Yep. I love right. acronyms, you guys. You, you have, she does, she does. <laughs> you have to know what's normal for your horse. If he normally eats his hay first and then his grain, which is not the usual way the horses do it, but for that's sure the way your horse do it, does it, great. If he doesn't eat his grain for two hours, fine. But if your horse is one that eats his grain, like, come on, grain, and then he doesn't eat it, then maybe that horse is showing you that, you know what, I don't feel so great. It's an early sign maybe of colic. Mm -hmm. um, body condition scoring, weight taping, all these things that don't sound like first aid and emergency, but if you don't know what's normal for your horse, then you can't tell when your horse is not right and that the vet needs to be called or that you need to even do something. Mm -hmm. So standing away from the herd, um, standing with the head down, different behavior, mm -hmm. all those kind of things. Um, and then I'll, the, next, the next section is don't have anything in your first aid kit, which we've covered that I think in a different one. We did. That you don't know how to use. Mm. And so that goes back to the first part. If you're a total beginner, then maybe all you have in your first aid kit is like wraps and bandages and gauze and things that you really can't hurt anything with. However, if you're more experienced, you've owned a horse all your life, you've done a lot of stuff, maybe then you have um, syringes and needles and maybe your vet leaves some prescription medication. Mm -hmm. So, But don't have anything that you don't know what to do with. Yeah. Um, it doesn't really answer a question the way she wanted, but it was the way I wanted. So, And I think there's a lot of other videos and blog information that we have on the TPR, yeah, we'll body condition scoring, the first aid video. Yeah. So all of those will be linked in the description so that you guys can have a learning adventure oh my if you want more information on this question. Last but not least, Han on our blog says, how do you know if your horse needs electrolytes and how much to give them? Huh. Um, 
So how do you know if they need them? Maybe we should talk about what electrolytes are. Yeah, okay. I think that's a great place to yeah, start. Okay. Electrolytes are minerals, and we think of sodium, chloride, potassium, calcium, magnesium. And they're charged minerals. They are throughout the body. They're important in um, hydration status, pH balance. They kind of run everything. So if your minerals, if your electrolytes are out of whack or out of balance, you're going to have muscle contraction issues. You're going to have nerve transmission problems. Um, you're not going to have the chemical reactions and the uh, metabolism go on correctly. Just they're, they're responsible for all the basic functions of your body. So if your horse is deficient in electrolytes, it's going to be it's going to be that last question, emergency. Mm. Um, so so let's let's enter in before then. And how you know your horse needs electrolytes is if your horse is sweating a lot. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be, you know, Olympic level elite athlete. It can be an all day trail ride. It can be I hauled my horse somewhere and mm. it got really hot back there because it was humid or there wasn't air moving or something. So anytime a horse is sweating, a Cushing's horse maybe that has a very long hair coat in the summer that wasn't clipped, it doesn't have to be doing, you know, four star eventing. Um, so if you're sweating, if you're a horse, you're, you're sweating out liquid, fluid, and you have to rehydrate, but you're also sweating out electrolytes that need to be replaced. Um, the first one I think I mentioned was sodium. So mm -hmm. when you put sodium and chloride together, that makes salt. And just standing, breathing, and blinking, um, horses need about 10 grams of sodium. Mm. So that's about 25 grams of salt. Mm -hmm. And that's about an ounce or so, which is two tablespoons. Oh, so considerable amount. If depending on and, and I did all the math for you. So whether you like to talk in tablespoons or grams or ounces, it's all it's all there. Um, that's the basic. And hay pasture grains even they don't have a lot of salt in them. So every horse is going to need salt. And you may know I'm not a fan of salt blocks because you know the original ones that are very rough, those large 50 pound ones, they're made for cattle tongues, which mm -hmm. if you've been licked by a cattle tongue, you know they're very rough. Um, they love them, they're great, but horses sometimes will, will like, act, I'm not getting what I need from here. So they chew it with their inside, they scrape it. That's so, you know right there. So we like to top dress our salt and our electrolytes. Um, and there's a couple products, you can top dress powders, you can top dress pellets, because you can imagine pl just plain salt or plain electrolytes can be a little bit <laughs> tacky. So um, if you put it in a pellet, it's got some flavor in there and it's less likely to be blown out or dumped over or left in the bottom. Mm -hmm. So I'm also not a huge fan of putting the, like, the electrolytes in the water, mm. but if you do that and you've trained your horse to drink that, Make sure you have a bucket of plain water, because that's the point. You can't just give them electrolytes. You have to give them plain water, because that's what they're supposed to do after they have electrolytes, right? So you have to have plain water available. Because otherwise they're just getting thirsty and then drinking and getting more thirsty. Exactly, and you don't yeah. Want that. yeah. Yeah, and so you're unbalancing further their internal systems. So it sounds like your horse always needs electrolytes. He just needs to be fed more if you notice those things like the sweating, the Very working well really said. hard. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you for <laughs> summarizing this. That's uh, what I meant to say. I, I knew it. <laughs> I sensed it. So that's all we have for this month. Thank you guys so much for submitting the questions. We are already accepting questions for next month's oh, video. We are. Oh yeah. Oh. We are always accepting <laughs> okay. questions. So if you want to win one of those gift certificates uh, to Smart Pack, you can absolutely do that. Submit your question on our blog, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, email customer care at smartpack.com. Use hashtag ask the vet video so we can keep track of those great questions and enter them in next month's voting. Don't forget to vote for your question and get all your friends to right. vote for your like question. This like did. we had, yeah, right. getting all those votes in there is very wise. So keep an eye on our Facebook and Instagram for notifications about when we're going to be um, posting those for the voting for next month. And if your question was answered in this video or previous videos, you can email customercare at smartpack.com and we will get your gift card out to you. You can also check your DMs if you are on YouTube. We will be messaging you there as well. And don't forget to subscribe so that you don't miss oh, next month's yes. video and see if your question gets answered then. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Have a great ride.